everybody to our little seminar on canine distemper virus. Um, I'm Dr. Melissa Eads and I'm a small animal um, veterinarian in uh, Katy, Texas near Houston. Um, so um, we're going to go ahead and just start the seminar. Um, hang on just one second, my screen. There we go. So um, this is just an overview of what we're going to be talking about, the main points here. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot about the clinical signs of distemper and, um, you know, all those symptoms you're going to be seeing. <clears throat> a lot of people call this, you know, a disease that you easily diagnose by clinical symptoms. There are tests that you can run, but... Um, you know, most, a lot of times you may not be able to. And so um, there are some symptoms that you will see and you can pretty much diagnose it that way. Um, and then I am gonna discuss different ways, um, different blood tests and um, different things that we can do to get a, a more definitive diagnosis if that is available to you. And then we're going to talk about some treatment um, and then very importantly, we're going to talk about prevention. That's really the most um, the most important thing I wanted to talk to y'all about today because this disease is, you know, highly preventable, and um, we really need to communicate that to the um, pet owners and emphasize that. So, um, so some key points about canine distemper virus. So it is an RNA virus of the Paramyxoviridae family, and it's a more bilivirus genus. It's actually kind of similar to measles in, um, in the human um, arena. So this disease is very contagious. Um, so that's something important to know if you do diagnose an animal, a, a dog with um, distemper, then you're gonna need to, you know, communicate that to any other people that have come in contact with that or any other dogs that have come in contact with that dogs. If it's in a, um, a shelter setting or, you know, if it's been around friends, dogs, then we really need to um, tell them that this dog has distemper because it's, it's just so contagious. Um, it's also what we call a multi systemic disease. So that means it's going to affect all different types of the body. Um, and I like to say distemper does what distemper wants to do. Um, some diseases, you know, it's, um, you know, like parvo, it, it's pretty much always just the GI tract. Well, distemper, it can be the respiratory tract. It can be the skin. It can be the GI tract, even the urinary tract, and then also the central nervous system. And it can affect all of these um, different body systems, or it can just affect one. Um, I've, you know, talked with several different veterinarians about their experience with distemper, just to kind of, um, you know, see what they've been seeing before. And um, several of them say, oh, I, I had a dog that just had eye conjunctivitis, you know, really goopy eyes, or I had one that just had myoclonus, which is the muscle twitching. So sometimes they just have one of these symptoms. Um, so that's just important to know if, if you have a dog that just has one, one of them going on, you still need to be thinking about um, distemper on your differential list. Um, dogs are the principal reservoir host for this disease. So they're the ones that are gonna be carrying it and spreading it. Um, it can actually affect wild um, dog type species, wolves, foxes, um, ferrets can actually get distemper. I don't know in India if people have pet ferrets like they do in the United States, but um, if people do have a pet ferret, we can actually vaccinate it for distemper so that we don't have to worry about that pet getting, um, getting distemper. Um, another important point to remember is that co-infections of the respiratory tract are very common. And we call this canine infectious respiratory disease complex. So um, what happens is these dogs will get 
the virus in their respiratory tract. It's also suppressing their immune system. And so they get secondary bacterial infections in the lungs and can develop severe pneumonia from the bacterial infections. And the reason that's important to remember is although we don't have a treatment for the virus, we do have antibiotics that we can treat for these secondary rest, uh, bacterial infections. Um, they can also get bacterial infections of the skin from this disease. But um, So when I say there's no treatment, I mean there's no, I guess there's no cure for distemper. Um, you know, it, some people have tried antiviral medicine, other different things, but really it's, it's supportive care, treating those secondary bacterial infections. Um, but again, the very important point is that this disease is completely preventable with vaccination. Actually so preventable that I have only seen a very small handful of cases in my 10 year career so far, because everybody in on my area pretty much vaccinates. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely talk about that, um, more a little bit later on. And so, um, just to kind of remind you, you probably learned in, in training a little bit about, um, how this virus works. Um, it is, um, so the pathophysiology, so it's very, um, prevalent in, um, respiratory secretion. So basically when the dog gets the virus, it's going to replicate and replicate in the lungs and then it's gonna kind of spread via the lungs most of the time so they'll develop a cough and or like kind of breathing um, and they'll spread it that way and it can be through aerosol which is just you know cough which is another dog or it can be, or it can be their, their, um, if they spread in other ways it can be if they have diarrhea and that contaminates an area that you can spread that way. If they're using a shared water bowl and their saliva gets in the water bowl and another dog drinks out of it, then they can get it that way. Just remembering it's really highly contagious. Um, so within one day of it becoming um, in contact with um, lining, that epithelium, then it's going to start multiplying in those macrophages and that's a, a white blood cell and then that white blood cell carries it to the lymphodes. and that's why it spreads through the whole body and that's why it can kind of attack all these different body systems because then it's gonna replicate and you know reproduce in the the lymph tissue so it can be in the lymph nodes in the liver in the spleen and then um it's gonna go through the blood to all these other different uh, parts of the body, like the central nervous system and the skin, the GI tract, all of that. So um, what's important to kind of know about this is it says that it's the, you know, it kind of gets infected in the skin and the CNS tissue, that um, nervous system tissue by day eight or nine. So if we're talking about a typical case, it's going to present probably with respiratory symptoms and then develop neurologic symptoms later. But again, um, distemper can do what it wants to do. So maybe they didn't have a very severe respiratory in infection and then they're, and so it was kind of unnoticed by the owner or the veterinarian. And then later on, they just kind of de develop these neurologic symptoms with seizures, um, muscle twitching, all of those things. And then the other important point is that it does, because it attacks the macrophages and the lymph tissue, it actually causes the immune, the immune system to be suppressed. And then it can't fight off these other infections and it can't fight off the virus. So it's kind of a vicious, a vicious cycle there. Um, and interestingly, how the body responds to the virus has to do with um, how bad the dog is going to be infected and how sick it is going to be. So some dogs actually are infected with the virus and they have a really good immune system and they just 
attack the virus and it's cleared and they actually have no symptoms. And in my research, um, they actually said that up to 50% um, half of the cases may have never had a symptom. Um, and so, but they, they can still spread it to other dogs. Um, but just kind of remembering that. And then if you have a dog that has kind of a in-between immune response, then um, they can develop some of the symptoms, but then sometimes they can eventually clear it and, and have immunity and survive. Um, and so those are gonna be those dogs that you see having some of the symptoms and then, you know, don't give up on them. They may recover, they may survive. Um, and then of course there's um, another percentage of dogs that just they're not gonna have a good immune response and they're gonna eventually die from the disease. Um, that's gonna we all know this. It's gonna be a young dog that's never been vaccinated or not appropriately vaccinated. Um, and it's going, there's no, it doesn't affect male or female um, more than the other. And um, there's no specific dog breed that it affects. It's just, you know, male and female, any dog breed, mostly young dogs. I think that's because their immune system is still developing and an older dog probably had distemper at some point and cleared it. Um, and so they're oh. probably um, just, you know, already have that uh, immunity from having the disease before. All right, so let's get into some clinical signs here. Um, I have some pictures here, um, but early on, typically what you're gonna see is um, a dog that is not feeling well. And he's, or she's probably going to be not wanting to eat, having a fever, dehydrated, um, the, the ocular discharge, that kind of green goop around the eyes is very common. The conjunctivitis, um, they can be coughing or having an increased um, breathing rate, an increased respiratory rate, because maybe they do have a pneumonia going on. Sometimes you can see GI signs. Um, in the veterinarians that I spoke with, and just in my experience, I haven't seen as many of the GI um, symptoms with distemper, but it is definitely possible. And then um, they can also get um, skin infections. Um, so this, the top picture on the left is something called pustular dermatitis. It's just pus filled skin lesions. Um, and then again, the one on the right is just showing you the, the goopy eyes and kind of a little discharge from the nose. And so again, typically you will see respiratory symptoms first and this, um, you know, just lethargy, fever, all of that stuff. Um, interestingly, sometimes you can actually, uh, distemper can cause something called a biphasic fever, which means they get a fever um, early on in the disease, and then it may go back to normal temperature, and then they have another fever. They spike another fever later on. Um, so if you have a pet that's had, you know, a fever going up and down, then definitely be thinking about distemper. And then later on, um, they tend to get the neurologic signs. Myoclonus, again, that's just the medical term for muscle twitching, very common, very common to see. And it can affect any muscle. Sometimes it's just the muscle on, like one of the muscles on their head is just twitching. Sometimes it's a, an arm, you know, it can be anything. And then some of these dogs, I mean, progress to seizures, which is just very sad. And at that point, it's pretty much, they're very difficult to control. And, um, you know, they just have so much inflammation in their brain that likely they're going to pass away very soon. Um, they can get paralyzed. So um, just the back legs paralyzed. They can have all four legs paralyzed. That's the paraparesis and the tetraparesis. 
They can have vestibular signs, which is like where they're circling. Um, they're having a head tilt to one side. Um, and then hypermetria is just where they're kind of using their legs, almost looks like they're like a marching soldier. Um, and then um, they can also develop something called hyperkeratosis of the foot pads and the nasal planum, which is like that um, just kind of front part of their, their nose. Um, and so distemper is actually called hard pad disease. And so the, the pads of the, the feet get really hard. That's what that hyperkeratosis means. Again, they do not have to have that. If they just have a muscle twitching, they can have distemper. If they just have a conjunctivitis, they can have distemper. But if we're talking about more of a classical case, then it would be presenting with respiratory signs, developing the hard pads and the neurologic signs later. Um, and just to kind of something to keep in the back of your mind, um, if, if a very young puppy was infected, either in the mother's womb or right after being born, um, they can develop this enamel hypoplasia, which is where the, the, it's like eating away of the enamel on the teeth. And that's the picture on the right. Um, so if you see that, then be aware that that litter was likely exposed to distemper. Um, they can also develop hypertrophic osteodystrophy, which is um, kind of a problem of the bones and the ends of the bones. They aren't um, developing correctly. And so they can have limping and, you know, um, just be walking funny or being sore on their bones. And then again, if they are in the womb, then sometimes they're just, um, they just pass away in the womb and you can have um, stillbirths and, and abortions from um, the virus if the, the mother is infected. Okay, so diagnosis. Again, most of the time, we're gonna just base it off of clinical signs, but um, there are some blood work abnormalities. If the, the dog is able to go to a hospital and have blood testing done on a CBC, the complete blood count, you can see um, anemia, which is like a low red blood cell level. You can see uh, lymphopenia, which is a low uh, lymphocyte level. And then um, neutrophilia, so those neutrophil counts are gonna be high, they're trying to fight off that infection. And then like a low protein level. Um, if the dog had severe breathing difficulties, if it's breathing really heavy and coughing, and um, fever, then, you know, if all possible, you'd want to probably try to take an x-ray of the chest and see if it has this bronco pneumonia. Um, you can also just listen with your stethoscope and typically hear some, you know, increased lung sounds and diagnose the bronco pneumonia that way and, and then be able to give that animal some antibiotics. And then here in the United States, we have um, some awesome testing called PCR testing, and it can be run on just blood draw, or it can be run on a swab of the um, like eye discharge or the nose discharge. Typically, we just do it on the blood because that's the easiest to obtain, um, but it's just detecting the, the viral particles. Um, the only caveat to the PCR testing is that if the dog has been vaccinated recently, then it can be falsely positive. But if you know this dog has not had any vaccines and you do this test and it's positive, then you pretty much have your diagnosis. Um, we send these tests off to a lab. So it's not a test that we would do in the hospital. It's not a, a bench side test. Um, we just draw the blood and then we, and here in Texas, we send it to our diagnostic lab and they run that for us. So if that was available in your area, then, um, you know, that is something that can be done. All right. So let's get to some, some treatment options. Um, so we're going to be doing supportive care of these animals. Um, if they're dehydrated, if they're not eating, 
fluids would be great if they're in the hospital, you know, IV fluids, putting a catheter in and giving fluids that way. But say you're not at a hospital or the owners can't afford that, you can do fluid underneath the skin called subcutaneous fluids. I know um, one of the other veterinarians that was presenting kind of discussed how you do that, but basically you get a, a bag of fluids and a line and you connect um, a larger needle to the end of it, like an 18 gauge needle. And you just kind of pull up the skin, almost like you were going to give a shot and you, you poke that needle in there and you leave it in there. And then you open up the, the line and, and let the fluid kind of go underneath there and then kind of get a little camel hump right there and the water, uh, the fluid just kind of stays underneath that skin. Typically for a 30 pound dog, we'd give about a hundred milliliters of fluid that way. Um, and you can repeat that again, um, the next, you know, for several days if they need that. Um, and then um, there is something called nebulization that we can do here where we just have a little um, machine that kind of produces a, a aerosol of some medicines. Um, it also just makes like a steam and that helps their breathing if they're having the pneumonia. Um, but if y'all are not able to do that, then you can also just have them, you know, if the owner has a small bathroom with like a shower or a bathtub, you can just run hot water in the shower or the, the bathtub and, and fill the room basically with steam from that hot water and have the pet in there with the owner. And that steam will kind of help, help them breathe a little bit easier. Um, we also want to again, treat these secondary bacterial infections. Here in the United States, the best, I mean, the best antibiotics to use for these respiratory infections would be um, amoxicillin. Um, if we were going to be able to give pills, then we'd want to use that amoxicillin, 20 milligrams per kilogram um, given by mouth every eight hours. Sometimes we just do it twice a day, um, depending on how bad the infection is. If they were in hospital and they had a catheter in, then we can give them ampicillin um, IV or sub Q. And then um, doxycycline is an amazing drug for the respiratory tract and those infections. Um, so we tend to use that one a lot. Um, and so we give them orally doxycycline um, five to 10 milligrams per kilogram twice a day. And then here on the right, I have some pictures of some antibiotics that are more available to y'all. Um, and so that enterofloxacin is great. It's a, a broad spectrum antibiotic. And so um, you could definitely use that one. Um, probably, you, I think you can either do once a day dosing at a higher dose or twice a day dosing at a lower dose. Um, and then there's also... Uh, that penicillin would be another good choice there. And then, you can also, um, if they're having seizures, then you can try um, anticonvulsant, which is phenobarbital, um, 10 milligrams per kilogram um, once IV if they're actively seizuring, or you can do 2 to 8 milligrams per kilogram by mouth. And then again, if they're in an active seizure and they're not stopping, we call that status epilepticus. They're just continuing the seizure. You can try diazepam, which is also Valium. You can give a single dose of that IV, or if the dog's seizuring, you can't hit it a vein or give it IV, then you can actually give it rectally. So you just fill up the syringe, take the needle off, and, um, and then insert the, um, the syringe rectally and then just inject it and it'll actually absorb through the um, mucosa rectally. All right, so prognosis. Um, it's really based off of clinical signs. If you're seeing a dog that, you know, maybe it just has mild signs, it just has a little you know, a little eye goop and a little cough, and you know, maybe you treat it for bacterial infection, then um, it could it could do fine. It could, you know, recover. 
But if you're starting to see the neurologic signs, especially the seizures, then that dog is very likely going to, to not make it. It's going to pass away. Sometimes if they just have the muscle twitching, those dogs can recover. Um, and depending on how much scarring there is in the nervous system, sometimes they may have that muscle twitch for life or it may go away and they could actually be fairly normal. Um, also just important to remember that this is a very high mortality rate. Half of, half of them are not going to survive. So you need to let the owners know that um, when you're talking about treatment, if their dog has that, say, you know, we're going to try, you know, if you want to try, we're going to try with these medicines and we're going to try to do the supportive care, but it's very, you know, you have a 50, 50 chance that they may um, pass away. So, all right. My favorite topic here, prevention. Um, so vaccination, we really need to be vaccinating these puppies. It's just key. And I know I'm um, just talking with Dixon and, and Dr. Benjamin that, um, you know, owners are not just super keen on vaccinating. It's an expensive vaccine for them. But I think if we can do a good job explaining how this is going to potentially save their pet's life, then, you know, maybe they would be more likely to vaccinate their dog. So um, there's different types of vaccines. There's um, a recombinant vaccine that has a little bit less side effects. There's also a modified live vaccine. Sometimes you can see some like cellulitis, which is just like inflammation underneath the skin um, from that one. But I mean, it would still be worth it to, to vaccinate the dog, even if it was a modified live vaccine. Um, so the vaccine schedule is very, very important. Um, they drill this into us when we're in, in vet school here in Texas. Um, you have to do it at the right timing or it's not going to work. It's just throwing money away. So um, again, this is another way you can communicate with the owners is like, okay, we're going to start these and you have to finish the vaccine series or else um, you are, it's not going to be worth it. So um, we typically start around six to eight weeks of age. That's typically the first time we're seeing the dog because, um, you know, it's been with the mother and in the litter, if it's from a, you know, like a breeder. And, um, and so then um, the owners get it about six weeks of age and they'll bring it into us. And so then we'll, we'll give it its first vaccine about six to eight weeks. And then we're going to repeat that every four weeks until it's about 14 to 16 weeks old. So a typical dog is going to get three puppy shots if we're seeing it at like six to eight weeks of age. So it'll be like eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks. It needs all three of those because what's going on in that dog's immune system is it's been getting um, antibodies from the mother whenever it was nursing and also just when it was born through the placenta, it got all of these antibodies likely to distemper because the mother was either vaccinated or exposed to it at some point. Um, and so those maternal antibodies that the puppy gets from the mom, they actually are interfere with the vaccine. So they kind of make it less effective um, for long-term immunity. So if we just did an eight week and a 12 week shot, those maternal antibodies are going to be interfering with that vaccine and that dog is not fully protected. So it really, really needs that third shot at the 14 to 16 week mark. And actually this is the same for Parvo. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone if you're able to give a distemper Parvo vaccination. So you're gonna wanna do, you know, six or, yeah, eight, 12, and 16 weeks. Um, and then if you're seeing an older dog, say it's, you know, four months old, then you can actually just give a shot of the distemper virus then. Um, and then you can repeat in two to four weeks and then it'll be fully vaccinated because you're not dealing with those, those maternal antibodies. Um, and then here in the United States, we also will do a repeat vaccine when they're one year old for distemper and parvo. 
and we will then um, vaccinate them every three years for that. Or actually here in Texas, we have um, our vaccine has leptospirosis in it. And so um, we do vaccinate that with that one yearly because it just needs it for the lepto. So our dogs here are getting it yearly, but really the science shows it only needs to be every three years once that dog is past one year old. And then other preventative measures. So if you're dealing with an outbreak situation, then um, you're gonna have to do a lot of disinfecting and quarantining, like if this is a kennel. Um, luckily the disinfectants are, are it's fairly um, you know, susceptible to just basic disinfectants and you know, dilute bleach and, and all that stuff. So if you wanna clean out. Um, and then just quarantining the sick pets, you know, so they don't spread it to, to others. Um, and then also, um, this is important because here, um, we emphasize to our owners of, of small puppies that, um, young puppies that they need to keep their pet at home until it's had all of these shots. You know, if we, if, even if it's had, it's, it's eight week shot and it's 12 week shot and they go out to a park and it's playing with another dog, they could still get it. They could still get to simper. So that pet is not fully protected until two weeks after it's 16, 14 to 16 week shot. That's when the immune system's had enough time to fully protect it. And then I say, go for it. You can go play with the dog wherever it's fully vaccinated. But it's important to, you know, let owners know, you know, especially if this is their beloved little pet, they need to keep that dog, that puppy at home. Um, it can be around other dogs that have had vaccines and that are fully vaccinated. That's fine. Like if they have another pet or they have um, family members that have another pet, then they can um, let that dog interact with the, those dogs, but um, not just any dog that, you know, is out there. All right. Um, so I'm going to open it up to some questions. I know we already have some here, so I'll kind of, um, look at those and okay how does it cause enamel hypoplasia could you ex kindly explain the mechanism i let me see if i have any notes on that specifically i don't think in my reading it didn't exactly um explain it i think it's just the virus starts attacking the the enamel um, another thing that actually can cause that is giving um, certain antibiotics at a really young age that can also cause enamel hypoplasia. So um, kind of be looking about that too. I think it's like the tetracycline, um, clindamycin, te yeah, clindamycin. Um, do recovered dogs act as a carrier? No, they, I mean, I think once they're they've fully cleared the virus then they are not a carrier so you don't have to worry about you know a dog several months later giving it to other pets and then do you vaccinate recovered dogs so actually they said that recovered dogs have full immunity for a while but um i would probably vaccinate that dog after it's like fully recovered maybe a year later, because they do need, you know, like the boosters and things like that. Um, so we, you know, obviously a puppy that's had all of its shots, we're gonna still booster that dog um, with a vaccine like a year later. So I'd probably go ahead and still vaccinate that dog with its yearly vaccines, like when it gets its rabies and stuff. But um, I wouldn't worry about vaccinating it right after it's recovered. And then it says, some say chloramphenicol work. Um, is that for, what would that be referring to? Like just for the respiratory infections or for just the virus in general? And this says, will immunoglobulin therapy help in a case of an infected dog? We have never um, experienced doing any immunoglobulin therapy here. Um, I guess that would be giving dog a serum from a, an, a recovered dog. I don't know. I mean, I think that we would have, if there were anything that was clear cut that it's working really well for this virus, I think we would know about it already. 
um, just because it's been around for a while. Um, and, you know, if there was like a, a cure-all that we would know about that by now. Um, so there are things, you know, in all of my research, there are things that can help, but um, there's nothing that's going to, oh, yes, this, this antibiotic or this therapy always works for dogs. Um, really, again, you're just kind of trying to treat those symptoms and, and see if the dog can make it through that time when the virus is really just blowing up and affecting its whole body. And then if it can recover, then, you know, they can, they can be okay later on. Do you personally use amoxicillin sub Q root? I guess we can also give it IM. Um, so we actually give it IV. We use ampicillin and we give it IV most of the time because uh, we're able to have these pets in the hospital and to, um, you know, have them treated that way. Um, we use ampicillin. I'm not sure amoxicillin um, that product, we just use orally. So amoxitabs tabs is what we use. We just give that as pills. And then what to apply on the planum for cracks? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you can use, um, Vaseline just as a, you know, kind of an emollient to try to keep them more comfortable. Um, mupirocin is also a good uh, ointment. It's like an antibiotic ointment that you can just apply there just to kind of try to keep it moisturized. Um, I have had dogs that have had hyperkeratosis for other reasons, not just simper. And I've actually used a foot cream, <laughs> a human foot cream um, called Carousel. I can type it in here um, so y'all can see the name of it. I don't know if they have this there, but um, it actually kind of helps with the hyperkeratosis. Some old dogs just get that. So, um, send. okay. Is there hope of saving a dog after nervous symptoms have been shown? Should I treat it or go for euthanasia? I would say seizures. I mean, you can try, I, I, you know, I, it's just really unlikely. I and mean, I think it depends on the owner if they want to, to try. I, I don't think it's wrong in any situation to, to euthanize a pet that's having seizures from distemper. I think it's really unlikely that they're going to recover. Um, if it's just the myoclonus, the muscle twitching, I would, I would give that dog a chance and see. Um, I feel like that those cases are maybe a little bit more um, likely to recover than the seizuring. So. What do you think is the main reason behind the difficulty in finding a good antiviral for CDV? I think the main reason is that we have a vaccine and it's preventable. And so, um, you know, if people would just vaccinate, then we wouldn't even have to worry about treating it. Um, and I think, you know, so much research and money is put into the vaccine that you know, there maybe those companies are not really researching how to treat it because they just know that it's it's preventable, and so maybe they're not really researching the antivirals in distemper particularly. So, um, homeotherapy using conium maculatum we are using here as a supportive therapy. Okay, I have not um, heard of that, but. I did read, actually some people are using acupuncture for um, the neurologic symptoms. That was kind of the only um, homeopathic type um, treatment that I read about, but that's, you know, I think in these cases, if you want to try something, I think that's good because their outlook is so grim that if, you know, maybe, maybe it will work. Um, is there any chance of vaccinated dogs getting the disease from infected dogs if kept together in close proximity? Nope. They've been vaccinated, fully vaccinated with the three puppy shots or like the two sh booster shots if they're older, then nope, you do not need to um, worry about that dog getting the disease. So, I mean, I, I guess potentially it could get like a really, really mild disease. Um, 
if, you know, but its immune system is going to just kick it out and, and get rid of it and clear it. So, yeah. Um, hello, ma'am. Thank you for taking your time to share knowledge with us. Can you tell me, tell us more on controlling the neurologic signs? You have mentioned theme of barbital and diazepam, but are there other ways also? And how do we manage myoclonus in the case of a survivor? Um, so I, there is methocarbamol is another drug. It's a muscle relaxant. Um, if the myoclonus is causing the dog like discomfort, I mean, most of the time, if it's mild, they're probably not going to mind it that much. I mean, there are many times I wish we could ask them, is this bothering you? <laughs> but, um, you know, if they're eating and drinking, they're happy. They're just kind of living their life, you know, then if it's a minor thing, uh -huh. then yeah, I think we could just kind of let them be. But, um, if it's, you know, if it's really bothering them and then we could try methocarbamol as a muscle relaxant. There's also another drug called, um, I believe it's metilazine. I will also um, put that in there. Um, I'll write that down. Um, my laptop is not working for sending things. I'll, I'll, um, but yeah, there is another drug that um, at our clinic we tried for the muscle switching specifically. And I do believe it helped. It's a very, it's a very random drug that we had to get compounded at a compounding pharmacy. So it wasn't one that we could just find or had in our clinic. Hang on, just one second. Okay. I can't find it right now, but, um, okay, ma'am, a distemper survivor having muscle twitches kind of on a four foot dance, what therapy should we give? Um, a four foot. So kind of just up and down, up and down. I would try the muscle relaxant. Um, I guess my question is, is the dog, you know, completely survived and it's just um like how far out is it um sometimes they can go away on their own but like i discussed um it depends on how much scarring they have in that in that central nervous system any experience about electro electromuscular stimulation treatment like physiotherapy i haven't heard anything about that but um again the acupuncture is is what i heard and what is the average time taken to recover from nervous signs from your experience? Some fortunately recovered and still I have some recovered patients from distemper, but still um, distemper nervous signs are there. Any nervine boosting drug suggestions? Um, nervous signs. So in my experience, if they're seizuring, they just, they're gonna die. Um, and they've died in my experience. Um, so they don't recover. Um, the handful of cases I had muscle twitching in, um, I'm trying to think of what the time frame was to recover from that. I think it was like, so some of these dogs we treat and then we just are kind of like the owners leave and, and, and we didn't get like a good follow up with them. But then the dog came back a year later and it's doing fine. And I go, Hey, we're here for our yearly shots. And so, um, I don't know exactly the time frame of when that dog like recovered from the muscle switching, but I would, um, probably think like if it's going to recover, it would probably recover from like muscle twitching within, um, like three months probably would be my best guess there. And I don't know about any, um, nervine boosting drugs. Like what would be an example of that? I, I guess if you can type in there, um, ma'am, according to your experience, which antibiotics work best for treating, um, canine distemper cases. So for the skin, I would use penicillin. Um, we actually have one called Clavamox, which is amoxicillin with clavironic acid. That works really well for skin. We also use uh, cephodoxine or cephalexin. And then for the uh, lungs, I would use um, doxycycline if the pet was able to take pills. Or if they were in the hospital, 
then I would use IV ampicillin and um, sub-Q in rofloxacin. Um, oh, thank you so much. Your session was amazing. Could you please do another session on skin infections in dogs? We'll definitely keep, um, keep a note of that. And um, I'd be happy to do another, another lecture. But yeah, um, we definitely see a lot of skin infections because here in Texas, we have a lot of allergies and a lot of parasites. So um, that's a large percentage of what we treat. Um, unfortunately, it's not distemper because we're so well vaccinated, but I know that there's a lot of um, issues um, there. Now, I'm just going to try to look up this one drug real fast um, that I was trying to mention to you. Sorry that I didn't have this ready available. Are there any more um, questions? You can unmute yourself and ask question directly to Dr. Melissa. Yeah. Yes, please feel free to do that as well. Yeah. I know everybody wants to know about like treatments and it's just, I wish that there were miracle treatments out there because it's a very sad disease for, for these dogs. Um, but there's just not a whole lot that we've been seeing. Um, all right, I think I have it here. Uh, please feel free to ask question and we are going to close it down we will close the session quickly so if any more questions you can ask now and somebody is asking about have the future webinars yes we will be having future webinars with melissa also so please <laughs> We look out. I mean, whenever I send a notice, please register, then you will be able to join. Okay, so I have the, the um, will continue. Yeah, yes. I have the, the drug. So it's called um mexilatine, and I'm just gonna spell it because my it's not letting me send anything. Or here we go. Maybe if I try this. In the, you try in the chat box, type in the chat box. I am trying, yeah. Oh, okay. Did it send? Did y'all see the carousel? Yeah, okay, and then I'll write this other drug in here. Yeah, it does come. Carousel has come. Mix. Carousel has come. So this is the one drug that we used for the muscle twitching. So <clears throat> let's see if it has a dosage here. Mexilatine. Okay. Mexilatine. Yep. We had to have it compounded at a pharmacy. Now, when y'all mention immunotherapy, what, I guess, what would that be? What, what would be an example of an immunotherapy you would use for something else? You can just, you mean like, suppress, you mean like steroids to like suppress the immune system, I guess? Um, this also says that um, gabapentin can be used um, for kind of for some pain if the animal seems painful with the um, muscle twitching. It is also an anticonvulsant. It's just not a very strong anticonvulsant. We do um, 10, 10 mg per kg. Um, you can do it once a day or twice a day. Um, and then also um, we have a drug called alprazolam that could potentially help. It's actually a sedative, so 
it may sedate the dog, which you don't want. I mean, you don't want a dog just sedated its whole life, but maybe if you just wanted to try it, if it was having a really severe um, muscle twitching episode and try it for a few days and then see if it's able to like recover, I think that would be um, a good option. So, all right. Well, thank you all so much. For... Oh. No, oh, man. Well, okay. the... so it's just the no. carousel is just a like cream and you just put it on there like twice a day. It's a foot, a human foot cream. So there's no dosage or anything. Yeah. Okay. Do we use levotracetam in dogs for allergies and what are levocetirazine? Okay. Um, oh, is that like a, um, antihistamine? You can try antihistamines in dogs with allergies for sure. Um, most of the time they need a little bit stronger medication, but I've had some dogs that are, um, you know, able to be just on a, um, antihistamine and then in blood transfusion in dogs, the first or second time might not need cross examination. So if we use recover serum in a patient, any idea, huh? A blood transfusion. Um, I have never done any blood transfusions on distemper cases or anything. Um, so yeah, I think they, I mean, the anemia, I don't think is so bad that, um, I think it's more of like a mild anemia. There's something called anemia of chronic disease. And so it's just kind of like their, their body's just dealing with so much that they have a low red blood cell level, but they're not like dying of the anemia. So we don't do the blood transfusions in those situations. Any All more right. questions? You can put it, otherwise we are going to close it. Serum, okay. Yeah, again, we don't really do immunotherapy here. Um, Whenever we use um, like plasma and things like that, it's just gonna like from a dog, another dog, um, it would be from just because they have low platelets or um, something like, or low blood protein level. But yeah, it's an interesting thought. I mean, it, it you know, I don't know if that would work, but it seems like it might kind of like a vaccine, you know, if, if the dog was unvaccinated, if you're giving it, um, you know, immunity from another dog. So, yeah. The dog misses a booster shot of distemper vaccine. Should we revaccinate it again from the start? So, um, if it's a puppy and say it's coming in like six weeks later after its first shot, I would give it a shot right then. And then I would give it one more four weeks later. If it's an adult dog, um, it does not. So actually sometimes what we have is we have dogs. We don't know it's vaccine history. Say it was just found as a stray on the street then I would definitely do the two boosters. I would do one when we see the pet and then two to four weeks later, do a booster. So yeah, you kind of start again, but really only the puppies need that three shot series. So. I will ask a question maybe for on behalf of other people. Should mm -hmm. we need to do every year? It's a, it has to be vaccinated every year or is it only once in three years? Um, so we, you can do every three years. Yeah. For the in India, we, we do every year, we do vaccination. We do every year because we, our vaccine has leptospirosis in it. We use a combination. It has December, parvo, lepto, para, influenza, all that good stuff. Um, and so that the lepto has to be given every year. For the immune system to fully be protected against, excuse me, protected against that. So because ours is in combination, we just give the lepto too. And um, 
you know, maybe if a dog had a reaction to a vaccine, then I, you know, wouldn't do it yearly. I would space it out, but I have never knock on wood, seen a dog have um, a reaction to just the distemper part, but normally it's going to be the rabies or the lepto. So, um, yes, to to can be corrected any nerve stimulant drugs that can be used um, they can it can recover from it I don't know if it's what anything that we give them I think it's just that they are clearing the virus and the inflammation around the spinal cord is relieved um, I mean there always comes a time like okay should I try steroids on this pet, should I try something that would relieve the inflammation? But it's also this catch-22 because you're dealing with an infection. And if you suppress the dog's immune system even more, the virus could just go crazy. So um, it, it's a hard choice to make, um, whether we would use like a steroid at that point or um, just, um, you know, kind of try to support the dog through the paralyzation and see if it will recover. I have a rescued golden retriever. He's about five now. I don't know how much about his past. So after adopting him, he got one shot of the vaccine that had the CD antigen. He wasn't given a booster. Is that okay? I would booster him. I would, I mean, I would go ahead and, especially if this was my own pet, I would do, um, you know, give him one. I don't know when he had that first shot, but, um, I would just kind of restart with the two. So I give him one now, and then I would two weeks later, give him a booster, especially since it's so prevalent where y'all are. I feel like some pets here are protected because it's kind of like we have a really good herd immunity because most of the dogs here are vaccinated. And so, um, but if in India, that's not the case, then yeah, I would be really cautious and go ahead and vaccinate them, um, with the one shot and a booster. Um, recovered, but the nervous signs with wheelchair are having good results. Any comment? I think that's great. Yeah. If the dog, um, is able to have a good quality of life with the, the wheelchair, um, you know, then it's probably, it's probably, if it, I don't know how, how long has it been since, um, it recovered from the disease. But the one thing to work, to worry about with dogs that are paralyzed with the wheelchair, um, you got to make sure that they're not getting urinary tract infections. They're kind of more predisposed to that. Hopefully he, um, the dog's able to like empty out its bladder fully, but um, you may want to just check it every six months for a urinary tract infection, three to eight months. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's probably likely going to be paralyzed for life um, at that time because the virus is, is done doing its damage. Um, so, but some, some things you could maybe help with is like just some physical therapy with the dog and just kind of taking its back legs and just moving them and walking them. Um, if it has access to water, maybe kind of letting it, um, I don't know if it would be able to like swim or something like that. Um, you probably want to be really careful um, that it didn't, you know, drown or anything. We have stuff here like um, they have water treadmills for dogs that, for physical therapy, but um, you can just do it on the ground with like just moving their legs, kind of trying to stimulate those nerves. I'm Melissa. I'm Samantha, uh, and I just uh, wanted to ask you something with regards yes. to um, you know a lot of people take their dogs um, with them trekking and stuff. Like that. So how do you advise them with regards to wild animals transmitting uh, the infection of them, vice versa as well? Um, so the question was transporting them. I'm sorry, I had a little bit of trouble yeah. hearing. Um, sorry. Um, how do you explain to an owner or advise them about, uh, you know, getting the infection from wild animals? Um, because, okay. yeah. Um, so actually, most of the time, the 
domestic dogs give it to the wild animals and they don't get it back from them. That's why I was saying like the, the domestic dog is the reservoir host. So really, I don't think we'd have to worry about the, the dog getting it from like a wolf or something like that, or I don't know what wild animals will have. Um, but I think raccoons and skunks are also can, can get it. Um, yeah, but I mean, wild dogs, I mean, if there's like just packs of feral dogs, they could definitely get <laughs> those, but an actual like wild, like a different species, I think it would be unlikely, so. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Um, okay, and there's one up here. It says physiotherapy may need to be amplified in treatment because the supplement drugs alone may sometimes dull the pet's parent's hope. Um, yeah, you could do you could do physical therapy while um, you know while it's having um, treatment. Yeah, I mean, I think you just need to let the owners know that if we're going to try this drug, then it may make your dog a little bit sedate, but we'll just have to see how it does after we take it off of the, the medication. So don't let them lose hope that way. Um, and then can you please tell anti-rabies vaccination schedule? So rabies um, does not need to be boosted, but yearly. So here we give the rabies shot actually whenever we do the last distemper parvo shot. So about 16 weeks of age. And then um, we booster it a year later. And then we are actually able to do a three-year rabies vaccine here. So then we do a three-year after that, every three years after that. So one when they're 16 weeks old or whenever you're seeing the pet for the first time and then a year later and then every um, three years. But there is a specific vaccine that we use that is for three years. So I don't know, you'd have to make sure that the vaccine that you're using is, is labeled for a three year vaccine if you're gonna do that. If not, just do it every year. Um, did we vaccinate? Okay, ma'am, we did vaccinations annually in India. What is your suggestion of how long we have to vaccinate the dog in their lifetime? I, so yearly, um, it just depends on what you're seeing in your area. Lepto, again, is, is something that we see pretty often here. Um, it's a bacterial infection spread by rodents and other wildlife. Um, and they can get it from freestanding water. I'm near Houston, so we have a lot of rain and a lot of water and dogs that like to go in the water. And so um, I tend to just, as long as they don't have any other health issues, I vaccinate for lepto yearly for life. Um, if they're older and they have other underlying health issues, I may say, okay. And I also ask the owner, what, what does this dog do? Does this dog just stay in your house? Is it just your, your house pet and it only goes in the backyard to go to the bathroom? That dog has a lot lower risk for something like lepto, so I feel better not vaccinating it yearly. But um, I mean, probably by the time the pet is like 10, I mean, we've never seen a 10 year old have distemper or parvo if it's been vaccinated regularly. <laughs> um, so hopefully that answers the, the question. I'm very grateful to Dr. Melissa, even though we exceeded the time. Oh, some more questions are there coming. Okay. I encountered a where a pup missed a booster shot by a week and started having seizures for two days and also had frequent hemometamesis. Is that throwing up blood? I think. Um, the dog succumbed to this. How should we proceed in this case? Could this be a case of canine distemper? Um, so I believe that you can do a post-mortem testing. Um, I have never done that, but if you're worried that this dog had, it says it says it succumbed to this. Does that mean that it died from the um, symptoms? Um, I mean, if you're worried about, you know, I think that very well could be a case of December. Yeah, if it missed booster shots, um, and it's a young dog, it's a puppy, then yeah, I think it's, it's likely you should probably assume that it's just and you should probably notify the owner. Um, and you know, 
disinfect or, or whatever if they have other pets that aren't vaccinated, things like that. Okay. Also remember being told about a form of disease in older vaccinated dogs called old dog encephalitis. Am I getting my facts mixed up or is this true? Yes, there is old dog encephalitis. Um, let me see here. Okay, here it is. This is some information I have on that. It says old dog encephalitis is rare, chronic, progressive inflammatory disease of the cerebral hemispheres and brainstem. It occurs due to the persistence of canine distemper and nervous tissue in immunocompetent dogs. So I guess basically, um, if you do have an older dog that is presenting with neurologic signs, um, it could have had distemper as a younger dog and it just kind of stayed in its nervous system and then um, started rearing its ugly head later on in life. Um, I don't know how you would test for that necessarily. I think you have to do a C. You think you have to tap the CSS fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid, and test that for distemper. Because at that point, I don't think it would be in its blood. Um, but yeah, um, but I would think you could probably treat that dog with with uh, and if it's having seizures, anticonvulsants, um, things like that to try because it. I doubt that it would be as severe as when it first started having distemper. So I think, you know, that dog may be able to be treated and successfully managed, I guess, with anticonvulsants. Good point though. Distemper is a worst disease. The two, distemper and hepatitis, then parvo. This three will affect it. That should not be affected. When it affects it, it's very difficult to treat also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why we must, yeah. We yeah, must that, know in the early year itself, we must put a vaccination is the best right. to avoid the disease to come, isn't it? We have a saying here, I don't know if it will translate to India, but it's like a an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So yeah, yeah. There's one question is there. I don't know why it has come to me. Anyway, I can read that. What okay. is your suggestion in adjustment for hydropericardium in pit USG? Hydro, I'm hydropericardium. Pericardium in pit USG. Pet New Year's Day? I don't know about that. Or maybe USA, <laughs> maybe USA. Uh, yeah, USA. Oh, in USA, yeah. hydropericardium. I think we might have a different term for that. Um, here we go. I can read it now. Um, what is your suggestion in adjustment for hydropericardium? Um, is that fluid in the in the pericardial sac? <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's different reasons they get fluid in their pericardium. It can be from heart failure. It can be from a mass, a mass rupturing, and there can be blood around in their pericardium sac, if that's what this is referring to, but I don't know exactly. I think we might have a different term here for hydropericardium. Ultrasound adjustments. <clears throat> okay, ultrasound adjustment. So yeah, we can, um, yeah, you would diagnose that by, by ultrasound uh, fluid in the pericardial area. And you can actually tap it. I have done that. It's scary, but <laughs> um, you, you take a really long needle with the catheter and, you know, stick it in there. I did ultrasound guided and stuck it in there and, and got some fluid out. And it was actually a pet that had a blood in there and it had a mass that had ruptured and it had a um, hemangiosarcoma was the the tumor but you can draw off some fluid to try to make the pet more comfortable for a little while yeah 
Have you ever prescribed steroid for the treatment of the nervous systems in distemper patients? What's your idea? Oh, it's a tough question. Um, I have not. Again, I've, I've, I've treated very few cases. So most of this is just um, from my research and talking to other veterinarians that have seen more cases in their area. Um, so I haven't, but I, I think, I mean, it's a risk. It's a risk because steroids, as we know, suppress the immune system. The dog is already um, immunosuppressed from the virus. So you run the, the chance of them dying just from the virus going crazy. But also these dogs have inflammation in their um, spinal cord. And so, you know, that's what encephalitis is. It's inflammation of the, the central nervous system. And so the brain, spinal cord. Um, so in the treatment for that is steroids. So I think you could try it and just, you'd have to really inform the owner. Like I, we can just give this as a shot just to see if it will help. It may make it worse. And, you know, that's just, that's just medicine. Sometimes we don't, we don't know when we just have to, you know, try what we can. I'd probably go with an anti-inflammatory dose versus a, an immunosuppressive dose. So like prednisone, um, that would be um, 0 0.5 mg per kg. Um, so a little bit lower dose to try.